So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Catherine Wilhelm, Executive Director of the US Asia Law Institute. And I'm delighted to welcome everyone here in this room and also online on Zoom to today's guest talk by Professor Angela Zhang uh, about her new book, High Wire, uh, How China Regulates Big Tech and Governs Its Economy. Now, many in this room will already know uh, Professor Zhang because last semester she was a visiting uh, global professor here in the Hauser Global Program. Uh, she's based at University of Hong Kong, uh, but starting in the fall, she's going to be joining the faculty at the University of Southern California in the law school. Her research focus is government regulation, specifically um, uh, China's regulation of its big tech, high tech sector. By extension, she also looks, of course, at the question of China's impact, the, re the impact of China's regulatory approach on the rest of the world as Chinese high-tech companies become more and more influential. Uh, high-tech is her second book, following close on the heels of uh, the 20, 2021 book, Chinese Antitrust Exceptionalism, How the Rise of China Challenges Global Regulation. Now here to moderate our program today is Thomas Strines, who is Executive Director of the Guarini Global Law and Tech and a fellow at the Institute for International Law and Justice. Uh, he also convenes the Guarini Colloquium on regulating global digital co corporations and teaches co courses on global data law and global tech law. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Thomas. Thanks a lot, Catherine. Thanks a lot, everyone, for coming on such a beautiful, sunny afternoon in New York. It's really excited. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and uh, to celebrate Angela's uh, new book, High Wire, that you all, of course, encouraged to buy and consume. But today uh, is also an opportunity for us to discuss uh, the book with Angela uh, Chang. And for that purpose, we have two expert commentators uh, with us. Uh, we're sitting over there and on, on, on this commentator bench. Uh, they are Eleanor Fox, who's the Walter J. Derenberg Professor of Trade Regulation Emerita. And as all of you will know, uh, expert on comparative antitrust law and competition policy was taught uh, around the world on issues of competition uh, policy, innovation policy, and advised countless international organizations and taught um, many generations of antitrust lawyers at, at this law school. And I myself have benefited a lot from listening and engaging with her. And next to her, we have Harry First, who is the Charles um, L. Dennison Professor of Law Emeritus, a driving force of US antitrust law and a driving force behind together with Eleanor and others of making NYU law such an important hub for antitrust law uh, over the last decades and going forward. Now, uh, I had the pleasure, as was alluded to last semester, of teaching the Gorini Colloquium, regulating global digital corporations with uh, my co colleague Joseph Weiler and with Angela. And that was such a great uh, exercise of seeing the world differently from different perspectives, whether you think about it from an infrastructural perspective or from a platform perspective or from a law and global governance perspective. And it really sh makes a difference whether you think about the law of Google or the law of Facebook or, as Angela does, the law of Taobao. And to ask what are the similarities and differences across these jurisdictions, to what extent are the platforms, infrastructures, underlying ideologies, phenomena of datafication comparable or not. And her book, High Wire, is an attempt to give us a framework on how to think about Chinese tech regulation. So that's what we're going to do today with the author, who will start by presenting her account for about 30 minutes. Then we will hear from our two expert commentators. Angela will respond, and then we'll open it up for discussion with everyone here in this room and online. I think we have about 30 participants online who can use the Q&A tab to ask questions that I will uh, use in our discussion. But before we get there, we'll start with Angela. Thank you so much, Thomas. And it's great to be back to NYU campus. And thank you, everyone. Thanks, Eleanor and uh, Harry, for agreeing to come to Mother uh, to discuss the book with me. Um, they come prepared. Look at the book. It's full of post-it notes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and um, and also to my students, my former students um, who came to support me. Um, so great to see all of you. So the book was published on March 11th. So it's it's about oh exactly one month ago. 
And um, I'm happy to report uh, to my NYU community that it's been doing well. And um, I want to order another 100 copies to be shipped to um, Hong Kong for my events. Um, and it's all sold out uh, from OUP. So they're printing more. And I think this book can sell because um, not only because I write well, but more importantly, um, it's because it touches upon a very important sector of the Chinese economy. So the tax sector contributes to over 40% of China's GDP and employ over 20% of China's um, active labor force, right? They employ formally and informally over 200 million people. Um, and any sort of um, economic and government intervention into this sector can create a huge uh, market uh, consequences. And let me start by giving you a small example. So on the Christmas Eve of 2020, the State Administration for Market Regulation, being China's market watchdog, released this one sentence announcement that it is investigating Alibaba for the choose one for two um, monopolistic practices. And then 10 minutes later, the People's Daily, the, the party mouthpiece, released a long opinion endorsing um, the SAMR's uh, investigation. So this was seemingly well orchestrated in advance. Now, the next day, Alibaba stock tumbled more than 13%, which wiped out over $100 billion market cap from this company. Okay, So you may recall Alibaba um, ultimately received a fine of 2.8 billion US dollars from China's antitrust authority. But this was nothing compared with the market loss it has already received on the day of the announcement of the investigation. And over the following months, this firm lost over 75% of its market cap. So at its peak in 2021, Alibaba was worth over 800 billion US dollars. And today it really struggled as a firm that is worth only $180 billion, right? I mean, so, um, so this is what the book talks about. I mean, the book talks about why China want to initiate a, a tech crackdown and how it went about doing that and what are the consequences and, and the implications uh, for both China and the world. Now, the book not only talk about how China regulate its own tech, but also have implication for those companies operating in the United States. As you know, a lot of the Chinese subsidiaries of Chinese, uh, of, of Chinese tech firms are doing very well in the States recently. And the most prominent example is TikTok, which is now, um, I, I saw already one online uh, uh, participant already raise a question about TikTok's future in the United States, right? I mean, despite the fact that this company deny any links with the Chinese Communist Party or the Chinese government, but nonetheless, it has a very important link with China. It has a Chinese owner, right? I mean, so how China regulates ByteDance, its parent company will have also have strong implication on TikTok's future, right? I mean, the current bill um, that was recently proposed gave TikTok two choices. Either you divest from, divest, uh, sell yourself to a US buyer or uh, you just disappear from the U.S. market, right? I mean, the Chinese government a few years ago already introduced export restrictions that would that would potentially, um, you know, restrict uh, ByteDance from selling uh, its its critical technology to U.S. buyer, right? So, how China regulates ByteDance will also have serious implications on TikTok's future in America. So I will start by, uh, so in the following 25 minutes or so, I will start by uh, explaining what is the dynamic pyramid model, which is the central theme of the book, um, explaining China's distinct, distinctive model regulation. And I will use China's tech crackdown as a detailed case study to uh, illustrate how this model work in practice. And I'll, I will also briefly talk uh, about uh, the wider, potential wider implication uh, application of this model. Now, if we think about regulation as a system 
it's a really highly complex system uh, consisting of three major features. Okay, first we have uh, the structure, and then we have the process, and lastly we have the outcome. Now, in terms of the structure, I describe China's regulation regulatory structure is very hierarchical because it involves players from different tiers of the Chinese uh, society. Now, in terms of process, I describe it as very volatile, almost like very erratic. I mean, characterized by cycles of regulatory tightening and regulatory easing. Now, in terms of outcome, I use fragility to describe the outcome. By fragility, I mean that very often, you know, well-intentioned regulatory measures can generate vast unintended consequences. So that leaves the policymakers like in a constant game of a whack-a-mole because they have to try to deal with ongoing regulatory crisis. And then we can look at each of these feature uh, one by one. So let's start with hierarchy. Now, in terms of tech regulation, we see there's four major players in uh, China's regulatory system. You have the top leaders, you have the regulators, the firms, and the public or you know, platform participants. Now, despite the fact that the top leaders are very strong and powerful, they nonetheless need to delegate most of the work to the regulators who are in charge of the implementation of the day-to-day -day activities. Now, what makes the Chinese regulators particularly distinct um, in the Chinese system is that they either do very little or they do too much, okay? Why do they do very little is when the policy signal from the top is not very clear or what they're supposed to do kind of will be deemed uh, inconsistent with the top's policy, then they were trying to do as little as they can, okay? Because they don't want to be seen as carrying out an enforcement in contravention with Beijing's initiative. However, when the top leaders send out a very strong policy signal, then they were trying to do as much as they can because this is a point they need to demonstrate the loyalty to the top. They need to show that they are, you know, uh, uh, responsive and reactive to the top's initiative. So they were on the side of doing a lot. Okay, so that leads to a paradoxical phenomenon that they either do very little or do too much. Whereas at the firm level, firms tend not to challenge. Um, the regulators in China due to strong power imbalances between the government and the firms. Um, and as to the public, their voices tend to be mute, muted um, because of censorship and um, the information control. Okay? So as a result, you know, these four players uh, are organized in a highly hierarchical manner and regulators are only accountable to the top but not to the bottom. Now, in terms of the policy process, um, I just use volatility to describe um, um, this cycles of regulation that we often see. And in Chinese, we have the saying that yi zhua jiu si, yi fang jiu luan. Basically, if you loosen up, there will be chaos, but if you tighten it, there will be death. The reason is when you, know, you loosen up the regulation, when it was very lax, then you know, chaos started to emerge, but regulators didn't really take actions until things got very bad. And when they started to take action, they were so drastic and so heavy handed, then it tends to lead to very strong market backlash. And that leads to severe uh, economic downturn that eventually will prompt the regulators to, uh, to start uh, the regulatory easing, right? So we see the cycles of regulatory tightening and regulatory easing. And the China's tech regulation offers us kind of like a perfect case study, although it's a very sad story, but from an academic standpoint, it's a very good study. So now we see there's four major players in this hierarchy. At the beginning, uh, the top leaders were very supportive of the platform development. So nowadays, you heard the Chinese say, talk about AI plus initiative, but back in the days, there was this internet plus initiative. So the top leaders were very supportive, uh, 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 trying to nurture the, the growth uh, of the platform economy or the sharing economy. And the platform knew how to take advantage of such policy support by lobbying the regulators and the top leaders. So despite the fact that you know problems started to emerge at the platform level, there were a lot of complaints to the regulators, 
you know, the top leaders have taken a very lax, and the, the regulators have taken a very lax stance in uh, intervening in those matters, right? I mean, it's not like they don't do anything. They do have to respond to those complaints, but they have a wide variety of policy and regulatory tools at their disposal. They can pick and choose some lax uh, uh, tools to, to deal with a lenient, uh, lenient regulation to deal with those matters. So as a result, the information transmission from the regulators to top leaders was very slow. So the top leader didn't really know what has been going on and things have been, you know, tensions actually have been building up over the years. Now we all know this very uh, famous uh, incident where Jack Ma made a highly controversial speech in a financial summit in Shanghai in October 2020, which really spooked Chinese financial regulators. Now if um, you follow try, uh, the Western media um, discussion about what happened with the Jack Ma speech and the subsequent suspension of Ant's IPO, you had the impression that, look, I mean, this was the watershed moment that the Chinese government just turned its back against the private enterprises and, you know, they just want to sabotage uh, Jack Ma's business empire. But I think that oversimplified the situation. Um, in the book, I, uh, I went in great lengths to, dis to, to discuss, you know, the fundamental trigger of um, this, this incident was the long-standing tensions between People's Bank of China, the PBOC, and Ant Group, China's largest and actually the world's largest fintech company. So what was Ant? Ant uh, was a company spin-off from Alibaba five years earlier, and it has a very famous app called Alipay, um, kind of like a super app. Um, it's used by over 800 million people in China, 80% of the Chinese population use this app. And so it successfully leveraged this payment app into all sorts of financial services, the credit tech business, investment tech businesses, and insurance tech business. And the most successful business was the credit tech business in which they end as an, end as an intermediary, connecting ordinary consumers like you and me with the Chinese state-owned bank. However, 98% um, of those loans were extended by the state-owned banks, and Ant has very little skin in the game. And that immediately raised a question about moral hazard, right? I mean, because Ant as an intermediary would want to facilitate as many loan transactions as possible, but it wouldn't need to worry about, you know, potential default or liabilities. Um, now, in addition to this moral hazard problem, there is a big bubble in the making. Right before Ant's IPO, this firm got a market valuation of 320 billion US dollars, which is which was bigger than JP Morgan, the biggest bank in the world at that time. And that really worries China's financial regulator. Wait a minute, this firm was just been up from Alibaba five years ago, and now it's bigger than JP Morgan, right? So what happened was that Ant, in order to get a higher valuation, change its name from Ant Financial to Ant Group. Um, because as a financial institution, you can't get very high valuation, but you can get four times as much valuation if you are identified as tech firm. So Ant says, I am not a fintech company. I'm a tech fin business, okay? So as a result, it got a really high market uh, valuation and that worries the regulator of not just a moral hazard problem, but you have a big bubble in the making. And this thing is going to pose systematic risk to the fi uh, China's financial stability. So I think this is really what's happening. But Jack Ma's speech really spooked the financial regulators because it directly challenged their authority. And what changed at this point is that there is no longer information asymmetry between the regulators and the top leaders, right? I mean, they reported this matter to the top leaders who decided to initiate a massive enforcement campaign uh, against um, the online platform. So this campaign spread it like wildfire, starting with Ant's uh, IPO suspension and then spread through all sorts of sectors in the Chinese internet economy, right? Affecting Alibaba, the e-commerce business, and later DD right howling and online tutoring, right? I mean, so almost everybody in the internet economy was affected. And it was during this time, the top, um, President Xi introduced this 
highly controversial sl slogan called common prosperity, which worries a lot of the international investors that China is going to roll back its market reform and go back to communism. But if you think about what the government has been have been doing with this tax regulation, right? I mean, one of the most important things they're trying to achieve is that they want to empower those platform participants to better negotiate and bargain with the platform, right? So in a way that also help the top leaders achieve this equality goal and cultivate mass support. Okay. Now, however, starting from early 2022, the Chinese economy was doing very badly because China had been in economic lockdown for two years. And in February 2022, there was um, the Ukraine and Russia war. And then uh, investors start to worry that China might be in trouble for you know, extending uh, aid to uh, uh, Russia. And, and, and in March, um, the, uh, when some Chinese company listed in the US uh, face a potential delisting uh, risk, there was a massive sell off of Chinese stocks. And at this point, the Vice Premier Liu He convened an emergency meeting, uh, gathering all the major Chinese central ministries and sent a very strong easing signal to the market that we're going to ease tech regulation. And you saw the next day, the stock of Alibaba and Tencent rebounded 20%. And we see that ever since then, lawyers don't need to work on the weekends um, um, as they used to in the previous 18 months. And then they return to routine and uh, normal enforcement, right? So that leads us to the third major feature of China's tech regulation about the outcome. What happened? What are the consequences of this crackdown? Right? I mean, it's kind of like a roller coaster. Um, well, how we how do that that brings us to how do we measure? a resilience of a particular regulatory intervention. We look at two things. One is the potential unintended consequences, those side effects, and the other is the information lack. What I found with the China's distinct model regulation is that they tend to generate very strong side effects and long information lack, okay? Look at the tech crackdown. In, within a few months, it wiped out over a trillion dollars market cap from China's largest tech firm. Alibaba and Tencent each lose over 60 to 75% of their market cap. These are the biggest tech firms in China. And in turn, you saw the state sector started to advance and fueling in the void that was left by the Chinese firms, the, the tech firms, because the tech firms were asked to exit from those non-core operation business to reduce the influence in the tech uh, sector. And it was also during this time that the Chinese state-owned affiliates, uh, some of the uh, state-affiliated funds started to aggressively invest in the so-called golden shares of Chinese uh, social media platforms, um, companies like uh, subsidiaries of ByteDance, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, right? I mean, so that's why, you know, there's a reason why Americans are worried about TikTok, right? I mean, just think about there's a sister company of TikTok in which the Chinese government did own a, a piece of ownership, right? I mean, it has a golden share. By having a golden share, the Chinese government can appoint a representative to the board of those firms and um, exercise veto power over important corporate decisions like M&A and IPO, right? Um, and the government only needs to uh, get a very little leverage of one or two percent and, and have that, and have that um, control in the firm. Now, during this period, China also uh, was able to push through a lot of very strict tech regulation, uh, introducing uh, guidelines specifically targeted at the internet sector, uh, amended its anti-monopoly law for the first time since its uh, promulgation in 2007, and significantly increased its sanctions and expand the agency's discretion. And above all, they introduced the world's strictest data law China's personal information protection law model after the EU law, EU's GDPR in many ways are stricter than the EU law. And um, China also introduced very stringent cross-border data control rules that really annoy the business community because as you know, cross-border data transfer is so more uh, normal and routine in daily transactions. So these rules create a huge compliance burden for a lot of domestic and foreign businesses in China.
So although the crackdown was short-lived, it has led to long-lasting institutional changes, right? I mean, so in the book, I have a slightly more sophisticated diagram than the one I showed you earlier. Um, most important thing, the most important takeaway of this diagram is that you see these three features, they are interconnected by feedback loops, right? I mean, so when you have hierarchy, it tends to lead to volatility because of three sources of driver, right? Chinese top leaders are very adaptable, just like the man walking on high wire on the cover of the page. He needs to constantly balance competing interests. Um, and second, there's a lack of checks and balance in the Chinese regulatory system, as you see, you know, how agencies can, the antitrust authority can complete an investigation into Alibaba and also find this company $2.8 billion within four months. That's unthinkable in the US system. Um, most importantly, you have this inefficient information transmission, right? I mean, problems don't re usually reach the top until it's really late, right? And so the information deficit problem is particularly acute in a highly centralized hierarchy, hierarchical um, regulatory system. So all these three things lead to volatility in the policy process uh, as demonstrated by the tech um, regulation and volatility in terms affect fragility, right? Because when investors see such erratic, such dramatic regulatory pendling swing, they become very risk of us and that tend to amplify the side effects. That's why you see, you know, any sort of regulatory intervention create huge market uh, backlash. Now, what is interesting is that fragility also affects volatility because in the aftermath of the crackdown, investor sentiments are very low and they are very risk averse. So they are very nervous about any sort of news coming out from the regulator. So last December, when China's gaming uh, regulator introduced a set of new gaming rules to try to curb gaming activities, that immediately generated a sell-off of China's major gaming firms wiping out $100 billion of market cap from, you know, some of the biggest gaming companies like Tencent and NetEase. But it was never the intention of the gaming regulator to initiate another crackdown. I mean, they just saw that as another routine business that they need to introduce another set of rules. And that was the whole point of introducing the rules, the draft rules, was to solicit feedback from the industry. However, because investor sentiments were so bad at the moment, right, because of the side effects we're talking about, that immediately generated this strong market reaction. And what happened was the regulator immediately came out and said, we're going to sack this senior official introducing the rules and we are going to revise the law. So within a month, this draft law was completely taken down from the Chinese uh, regulate, gaming regulators website. It just disappeared. Okay. So you'll see fragility in terms lead to huge volatility in regulation. But most importantly, I think the most important finding of the, the, the tech crackdown is you see that fragility in terms also reinforce hierarchy because as the private sector retreated from um, the, the Chinese economy, the state sector has advanced, right? I mean, they have more aggressively buy out, buy out more assets in the economy, they were able to strengthen the control over tech firms by using golden share scheme or you know using the new regulatory tools that they added, um, right? I mean, all these new laws and expand the agency capacity. So now we have a feedback loop, a very clear feedback loop that hierarchy leads to volatility, volatility leads to fragility, fragility in turn reinforce hierarchy, right? So we are stuck in a vicious cycle. So I think this diagram also has some predictive power of what will happen with China's future tech regulation, right? I mean, unless we break the cycle, break this vicious cycle, right? I mean, we, we loosen up the hierarchy. Otherwise, we will continue to be, be stuck um, in, in this um, dynamic pyramid model of regulation. Um, now, that uh, brings me to the last point about the potential wider implication of um, this book. I don't think the dynamic pyramid model is specifically tailored to uh, tech regulation. If you think about it, this model can perfectly be applied to explain all sorts of major policy challenges that China is facing, has faced in the past few years. I mean, think about China's COVID lockdowns control, right? Um, the 
property crisis that China is facing at the moment. Property is another very important sector of the Chinese economy, contributing to over 30% of China's GDP. And it's direct trigger for the slowing Chinese economy at the moment. The 2021 energy crisis, as well as China's demographic crisis. We can use this model, and in the book, I actually you know, use this model to elaborate on how this applies to them. Let me just bring out, um, I think I'm a little bit over time, but just very quickly mention the COVID lockdown. As you may recall, at the very beginning of the lockdown, there was no, uh, at the beginning um, of, of the COVID, uh, when the, this disease first emerged, there was no pandemic control at all. The Wuhan government did nothing. Uh, in fact, what they did was to suppress information and to punish the whistleblower because so, so you saw very lax measure in the first stage. And at the same time, the Wuhan government was reporting this matter to upstairs, right? I mean, so because they wanted to get the clearance from upstairs before it decided what to do. But it missed the golden opportunity to control this disease. And it waited for weeks to get clear instructions by the time it got the instruction and then they initiated this massive lockdown, it's already too late. This thing has spread all over the world, become a global pandemic. Yes, China was able to get things under control within a few months with a very costly and very dramatic lockdown, but it came with a huge cost, right? And then at the later stage when Omicron emerged and it's proving extremely difficult to continue to stick with President Xi's zero COVID policy, China wasn't backing off from that policy until it's really, really late that it had generated massive protests and a lot of business complaints. And then overnight, all of a sudden, they relax um, all the pandemic controls. And, and, and that, again, you know, that dramatic easing, regulatory easing led to a very costly COVID exit, right? I mean, so that was another example where you see this huge regulatory pendulum swing. And um, now, but I want to, want to clarify one thing, is that this is a long-standing pattern of China's regulatory uh, governance. But what really changed and why we see more volatilities and more fragility in regulatory outcome in the past few years is because the hierarchy has tightened, right? So there's not a qualitative difference here. There is a quantitative difference, right? I mean, so unless we loosen up the hierarchy, then we will continue to see more volatility in policy process and more fragility in policy outcome. Um, so let me stop here. Um, I would love, really love to hear feedback uh, from my, um, from Harry and Eleanor. I mean, both are dear mentors to me. Um, so, and also from the audience. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot, Angela, for this very dynamic presentation of a quite dynamic model. Um, and we'll go straight to the commentator. So we'll hear first from, from Harry, but all of you could also start thinking about questions and comments you might have, and the same applies to our online audience. Let's start with Harry. Hi, everybody. If the Benedict's waving, you could at least wave, you know, say hi. Uh, like on Zoom. Yeah, there you go, right. Like on Zoom, right. Where are the people? Okay. Um, thank you, Angela, and thank you for this book. Now, I do have a lot of post-it notes, but actually, I didn't read anything. I just put, well, I shouldn't confess, I just put the post-it notes <laughs> in the book to make it look good. But... <laughs> Um, this, uh, this really quite an extraordinary book and, um, an extraordinary ambition to describe, um, in, in, with a lot of interesting detail, um, you know, a very interesting period in China. Um, and, um, and it's a very stimulating book and your presentation of it stimulated even more questions for me to ask. So. Uh, mostly my remarks are questions. I realize I look back on it. Um, so I want, I'd like to start back with a, um, sort of a basic question about the enterprise that people engage in in studying a different legal system. 
um, and and what people expect to get out of it. So I think there are three different reasons for studying another system. And interesting, I realized you've written this in English, so it's sort of like it's it's not in Chinese, yeah. so it is for an English yeah. speaking and reading audience. So in that sense, it's foreign, you know, I'll put that in quotes. So the first reason for looking at it is sort of a domestic interest, just to learn about that area. So just to learn about um, a country, about China, how is it arranged? How, you know, what's, what's the system? What's the legal system? It's an interest in the country in its own right. Um, so there's that aspect. Second is a comparative aspect. So how does China compare to something else? Um, you know, how is it like another system? Usually the system with which we're the readers familiar. So there's a comparativist lens to look at it. And then there's a normative lens, which is what's good or bad. What can we learn from this examination? And this is sort of three reasons for going outside your own system to look at another one. Um, now that's, these are sort of academic reasons in a way. There are also practitioner reasons. Um, so diplomats want to learn about another system because they do diplomacy in that system. Uh, business people do business in that system and lawyers do law in that system, do legal business. Um, so as I read the book, you do it all. I mean, you have, there's all of it in here uh, in the sense that um, there's information about the system itself. There are things that stimulate us to compare it to other systems. Um, so you got a combo. It's it, this is a trifecta. Well, it's a four factor uh, because here's um, so the very first paragraph. This is it's really bad when you're reviewing something. You usually take this is a hint, by the way, if you do it, take something from the middle of the book. So, you know, it looks like you read up to the middle, but I want to take something from the very first paragraph because I think it really does set the book in a very interesting way and tell us what it's about. So how does China regulate its big tech? It's, I guess the, it's in the first paragraph. Far from being a question only for academics, it's of interest to Chinese business and international investors. So I think this is your ambition. It is a big ambition because I think you, the book does satisfy academics who are interested in those three things, as well as lawyers or investors who are trying to figure out what the hell to do um, and understand the system. Now, I want to spend a little more time on the first sentence because I think the key tells about that help, help me think about those questions are actually two words in the first sentence. You didn't think it was going to go quite to the every word you write. Okay, so the first sentence, how does China regulate its big tech? One word is regulate. The second word is its. And to me, this is a clue to how differently China frames things um, and to understanding what's going on. So um, looking at it in a comparativist point of view, I would never write, how does the US regulate its big tech? We, we don't regulate, and that's even a bad word, but we wouldn't think of our system as necessary. You know, the question is, are we going to regulate big tech? Not do we? So that's the first thing. The second thing that's also interesting is the it's, the possessive. So um, it's assumes that these are Chinese firms now owned, not owned in a legal sense, but owned in a practical sense. They're China's firms. Now, if we were going to write this in the US, I don't think we would write, even if we regulate, how do we regulate our big tech, right? Now, it just so happens that it's all ours. <laughs> but it's not really because there's China, there's South Korea, there's Japan, there's a big world out there. Yeah. But so when we think about regulation, we don't 
we think about regulating the firms that show up. The fact that there's an acronym problem now it's gamma, you know, Google, Apple, Microsoft, um, uh, Meta, and Amazon. All right, those five firms, how do we regulate it? So the US doesn't like to think of it as their firms. I'm not sure, maybe that's a mistake actually, uh, because of the importance of these firms to our economy. But think about it if you're a European and looking at this. How does Europe regulate its firms? It doesn't have any. Now, okay, maybe a little exaggeration, but the firms that are focused on in the DMA are all US firms. Yeah. So these are very different frames around which this system is put. And it's in the first sentence. Um, so um, let, just to go a little bit on um, the three different perspectives, the finding out about China. And interesting, you mentioned a word about pattern. Um, there's a book written by, um, I think it was an anthropologist, Kurt Singer, called Mirror, Sword, and Jewel, written about Japan. And he wrote that um, what he was trying to identify was the pattern of patterns, you know, something that sets the pattern for every other pattern. Wow. And as a way of trying to understand Japan, and I think you can try to think about that uh, for China, because one of the questions you just raised, and the question I sort of didn't think about, but now do, so this dynamic pyramid model, is that the pattern of patterns such that that is the way China operates? Or is it changeable? Because it's responsive to some other pattern. How do we understand China qua China? You know, how is it really put together? Um, now, your description of it right at the beginning, you know, when a US reader reads it, the, the key difference is the apex of the pyramid. Um, the, you know, where the political power at the top, and I wrote it down because I love Politburo's, the Politburo Standing Committee of the Chinese Communist Party is the political leadership defined at the top. Well, um, however cynical one is about the US or however one views things in the US, it'd be hard to find an apex like that for the US. It would be a truncated pyramid. The rest of it's actually, you know, sort of familiar regulators, the regulated firms, the, the whatever stakeholders there are, those three parts of the pyramid, but not the top. Um, so, so that seems to me is a, a clear difference in trying to understand China and shows the reader, and I think you show this, that things can come out very differently. Um, even, um, you know, any trust regulation, which on the surface might look very similar, what SAMR does, the agency in charge, may turn out to be very different. Or maybe it doesn't, but that's for, you know, um, a question to be raised. Um, I, I was interested in the flashes of enforcement. Mm -hmm. The fact that actually some people do win in court, that there's a fair amount of litigation. Mm -hmm. These are things that not everybody knows about China. So uh, to me, from an antitrust point of view, quite interesting. Okay, so the comparative lens, you know, how does this compare to this? Another famous quote about comparative law is that comparative law is like holding up a mirror to yourself, <laughs> you know, because what you really have to ask is when you ask, you know, how does it compare to us? You've got to ask what your system is like. Um, so there are uh, competing, basically two competing narratives. China is very different from us. China is very similar to us. I'm not quite sure which it is, you know, because uh, you can find ways in which when you hold the mirror up, it doesn't look all that different. And yet, you know, it's different. Uh, so um, one area that um, uh, that in specific, and I'd love to have a little more discussion about this, because you write it a couple of times that Chinese companies are very compliant with what the government mm -hmm. ministries order. And um, so I wondered why, um, and particularly because it corresponds to a narrative in Japan that um, Japanese companies go along uh, under older procedures perhaps and settled frequently with the government and things didn't get litigated in court. Some people, Mark Ramsire, for example, had a theory that um, it's because the Japanese ministries are actually weak and 
don't insist on all that much. So um, it's not worth it to anybody to appeal. And the ministries don't want to appeal because they could get knocked down. I'm not sure that's right or wrong, but it's an interesting question because I don't view U.S. companies as being compliant in the same way. So I think that's an interesting comparative question. Uh, the normative question, um, so, you know, is the high wire system better than the US system? Are we better with that political part at the apex? Um, I don't mind volatility. Look, what the heck? Um, I've noticed that my stock portfolio, to the extent I have one, goes up and down. I mean, you know, there's volatility. Um, there's uncertainty. Uh, our agencies change their mind, so forth. But there seems to be some sort of maybe there's is there better political control? Um, and I'll, there's an example that I think is worth thinking about in this regard, current example, um, Nippon Steel's acquisition of U.S. Steel. So how should we handle it here? Is it just an antitrust issue? Mergers usually are. But this is one in which the president, Joe Biden, he's still the president, um, has weighed in on and has said he, he he thinks it should be stopped. Now, is that going to stop it in the U.S.? Should it? Should there be that sort of control that you sort of describe um, in, in the book? Um, and uh, I guess I have a, sort of two final more antitrust specific questions uh, that maybe we can discuss. Um, one is I've always wondered why Chinese the Chinese tech companies aren't a bigger presence in the U.S. And I wonder whether our U.S. antitrust cases are going to give them the opening, particularly with interoperability, to, um, you know, to gain access to U.S. tech platforms. So that's one question. And the second question is whether um, Chinese antitrust is for real or just a sham. <laughs> uh, and when we... You know, there was a period, there was one, I, I don't remember the, ex when the crackdown, you might call it, or whatever you want to call the tightening up on the big tech firms, and um, Samer did a bunch of things, and I thought, gee, this could be um, the Federal Trade Commission's policy on, or, or Joe Biden's policy on big tech. It sounds just the same. Now, was I reacting just to antitrust and being naive that this really is the Chinese Communist Party's policy? And they just want to quash uh, wealthy people and firms. So I think this is a tension, particularly in, in trust for looking at, um, at China. So I'm going to, I probably way exhausted my time. No, so no, turn uh, it over to Eleanor. This was perfect. Thanks so much for all the sage advice, both in terms of why to write a book and for whom to write it, but also how to read it and how to review it, um, but we'll turn it over to Eleanor to follow up. Thank, thank you, Harry, this is great. So hello, everybody. Good to see you. Um, Angela, thank you. Um, wonderful book. Um, Thomas, thanks for inviting us. Very nice to be here. Um, so I take the project as basically a political economy project. And in political economy, the underlying question is, who controls the market, the firms, or the government? And I'm going to come back to this because, of course, China and US have a different configuration, which is um, embodied even in your dynamic paradigm. So I am going to make comments in three parts. And my first part is about the paradigm. My second part is a little contrarian to most of what we've heard today, which is, wow, what I read on China is so much alike what is happening in the United States and in Europe. And then my third quick part is 
to say comparatively, um, what is at stake? In US, we say, in Europe, we, Europe, US, et cetera, Western world, we say, how can we control big tech? And what is at stake? And just briefly, and this will sort of be in conclusion, US, EU, and China. So first of all, talking about your paradigm, uh, which is very interesting, I would insert the market. I think the market has a big place in that paradigm. And if I do a paradigm that's somewhat similar or comparable from US, obviously, the market has a big place. So in China, I mean, obviously you're right, and it's very interesting the way you pose it, the party, the regulators, the, I insert, the market, firms and consumers. Ever since about 25 years ago, when, the, when China said, we're going to use the market, we need to use the market to make people better off because they're not as well off as they could be. Um, we need the market even to discipline the state-owned firms. We need the market for innovation. We need the market to enhance our economic presence as a leader in the world. So the party, the regulators, the firms, the consumers, let's do a US um, comparator paradigm. Of course, we don't have the Communist Party on top, but we do have a lot of industrial policy. And under that, uh, we do have regulators. We have the market bigger, perhaps bigger than China as, as a power source, but maybe not. I mean, this is the big question I wanted to come down to of the market and the firms and the consumers. But that's relatively similar if usually the market works and usually the Chinese authorities don't reach down and decide what they want firms to do and how to control them. And indeed, from my work with Chinese law and studying what SAMR does and its predecessor competition agencies, um, Chinese competition agencies are very savvy, well-informed on how to get good market results by applying their competition law. And before we came into the era where big tech dominates the picture, I would say that it was relatively rare when the party reached down and said, I want this result, rather than what normal international standards of antitrust will give us. Let me go on to my point two. I read your, I, I read, oh look, I have wow. some um, <laughs> evidence also, but I use green tabs, Harry. Um, I, I, I read selectively and then I read the antitrust chapter carefully. And that's chapter four. And when I read chapter four, I said, this is about competition. It's about how firms behave. I said, this sounds exactly like US and Europe in terms of the extent of the competition, the intensity of the competition, the moves that big tech make, both for the good and for the trying to preserve their domain, and the response of the governments, sometimes first lax and then, then more intrusive, and then saying, oh, and we also think we need guidelines. So similar. Um, I, I loved your description. And in fact, throughout the book, you have great factual description of exactly the kinds of competition, the way in which these firms are at loggerheads with each other. And then, oh, the way in which they snap up, as they say, vacuum up all of the startups who could be competitors to them. Um, building the moat around them, the way in which they try to prevent interoperability, because interoperability is the thing that make, breaks the back of power. If consumers can just turn to another system easily, uh, if they can put their data to another system, that's what creates competition and usually creates more innovation and stronger economy. 
um, so the big cats in China, even though they're protected a lot because of government regulations from the foreign investment, um, they do compete, they vacuum up the competitors, they impose the clauses such as choose me, uh, one of two, you choose me, you don't choose my competitor. The most obvious anti-competitive clause that you can imagine. And that is the clause that comes to be called when China starts to become less lax and say, yeah, we want to enforce antitrust. That's the clause that so many people call a crackdown. And to me is so incredible that it's called a crackdown. To me, I would say, so China recognized that the firms were actually not as competitive as they could be because they're imposing these restrictions. If you choose me, you can't choose my competitor. It means you cannot multi-home. If you cannot multi-home, there's very little competition that will control the power of the firms and competition can control power. Um, China has the additional um, aspect of wanting security and control, whereas US, Europe, freer, freer markets, um, jurisdictions don't put security on the list. They put chaotic competition is great. It's going to cause the firms to shape up, give consumers what they want, control power. Let me go to my last point. Um, because, oh, oh, yeah, I had to, just to add first, even to the extent of lobbying, just the uh, the big tech Americans learned to lobby. They're putting billions of dollars into lobbying as soon as they see the government on their heels. And the Chinese government, the Chinese tech lobbying as well. Um, Jack Ma comes in here because even though it may be that Jack Ma's hoped for IPO was going to threaten financial stability. Jack Ma, it seems to me, I think we've had this conversation and, and I think you agree with both sides. I mean, both, maybe China was worried about a financial bubble, but Jack Ma was basically saying the private market is strong and powerful and could do many, many things and can get and you can get really rich on it, which has for China both ups and downs. And the market was threatening the party. Uh, so final point, and this is can we control big tech and what are the stakes? Um, so of course China can control big tech. In US, Europe, in freer markets that is the framing, can we control big tech? In US, can we control big tech? What do we want to control? What are the really high stakes? Well, really high stakes, this goes for Europe too, fear that big tech is overtaking our lives, going to control us, controlling how we think, um, controlling information and making it disinformation. Um, affecting juveniles to do horrible things like suicide. Um, also, it has too much power. Power can be controlled by antitrust, but only so far. So are we controlling big tech in any significant way by antitrust? We're trying, this is we US, we're trying many cases in the pipeline. Uh, will they come out with any significant control? Maybe not. Um, Maybe, I mean, some of these, maybe the enforcers will win, but even if they win, what's really expected is there might be an injunction against clauses that are anti-competitive. There's not going to be a breakup, which would, of course, slice up the private power. EU, I would say rather similarly, um, EU has many um, cases. It also has the DMA. It also has these 
I would say tough guidelines, and you call them very tough guidelines of China, but China's drawing from the DNA. Another way in which China is really like the West, in which it says we need guidelines too, but it draws the guidelines from the West. Um, Margrethe Vestager, who is the head of competition in the EU, maybe for a crowning uh, legacy, would love to break up American big tech and has said so recently, but she's not going to do it. Um, so in US and Europe, we're left with concern um, that we may not control big tech. And, and therefore, the fear that big tech will still control us, and therefore, the fear that that will harm our democracy. A big part of the American and European fear is big tech is destroying democracy by shifting control to the power of these few firms. And now we go to China, and my goodness, the answer is totally different because what does China fear? It obviously um, is not trying to save democracy because they're not a democracy. China fears that big tech will push back the power of the party, possibly topple it. I mean, I see Jack Ma as really, what do you call it? Lay, putting the glove in the ring or something, laying down the glove, um, that this was a big challenge to China that China wanted to control. So China is now in this position. It needs markets for its people to be happy and not protesting and to make it strong and powerful economically in the world, but it needs to control the markets so that they don't topple the party. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Eleanor. So we have uh, really rich comments that speak both to the expertise of our commentators, but I think also to the book that raises so many questions about uh, the right level of analysis, what can we get out of the dynamic paradigm model, what can we get out of comparative analysis, and what are the normative implications. So um, I'll give the floor back to you to just react to what you would like to react to before we open it up to a broader Q&A. Yeah. So the good thing about the very rich discussion from Harry and Eleanor is that it, I can pick and choose um, the question that you asked me. But I do see the common theme in your discussion is like, you know, is China really different from the US? And how how is it different from the US? Or are they struggling with the same problem? Look, I mean, I think um, now one thing I want to highlight um, for those audience who don't know the Chinese tech sector very well is that China is really the only country so far that have been able to foster tech giants that can rival the U United States. Because if you look around in other countries, they all have US uh, tech firms, um, you know, successfully conquering their markets, but not in China because of the various trade barriers that the Chinese government has erected, like the Great Firewall to block the US social media businesses from operating in China and that partly also contribute to the flourishing of China's indigenous uh, domestic enterprises. Um, but, um, you know, but China and the US uh, or Europeans are struck, European countries are struggling with the same problem of how do we, you know, govern and regulate these big tech farms. And as Eleanor and Harry pointed out, I mean, a lot of the problems actually are very typical and standard antitrust problems. And um, if anything, the problem in China got way more severe. Um, the market um, is way more concentrated. Um, you know, here, Lena Khan write about Amazon's antitrust paradox when Amazon have about 30% market share in the United States. Alibaba at its peak has like 80% of market share. And like Didi, the right howling at, in the United States, you have Uber and Lyft. In China, there's only Didi, right? Have 90% market share. So um tech sector is way more concentrated and partly not just not due to the fault of our tech firms, but more because of the government's inactions and um, bureaucratic inertia. So, so in a way, you know, government failures also contribute to a lot of the market failures that we are seeing today. And um, the top leaders, for the most part, like I don't know, is, is absolutely right to point out, you know, at the beginning, there's they these are not the matters that can reach the level of 
President Xi Jinping. And then these are the routine agency actions. Um, so that, that's why, you know, all these regulatory tensions got built up all this time, but didn't reach to the top until, you know, there is this dramatic end IPO um, that really split the financial regulators that changed the entire game. And all of a sudden, all the agencies just flop to Beijing and said, look, I mean, we have, we have this problem and we have problem in right howling, we have problem in online tutoring and e-commerce and, 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 and so be it. So all of a sudden, you know, these problems surface and they realize this is really bad. Um, but these actions are actually long overdue. I'm not blaming the regulators for um, so from tackling the problem. But however, the way they tackle is a problem, right? Because the lack of checks and balance, right? There's almost no judicial oversight of any of these agency actions, right? Agencies just march ahead and then do whatever they want. And firm have give, just gave up and, and very little resistance. And, and that just reflect this strong power imbalances in the Chinese political economy where, you know, the government is really having the upper hand and business don't fight at all. They just gave up, right? I mean, unlike here. So there's the, the judiciary plays no role in counteracting agency overreach. And so it's very natural that the agencies uh, move gone too far. Um, you know, to put it diplomatically, these actions are very clumsy, right? I mean, so there's a very little due process uh, involved. And, and, you know, currently there are four major cases um, FTC or DOJ have brought against the biggest US tech firms. Um, query how far these cases will go, right? I mean, in the past, these business US companies have a great track record in winning the cases in court and, and court just throw them out, right? But in China, you don't have that. You don't have this checks and balance. And I think that is the fundamental difference between the US and the Chinese system. And then, and then that also explains why investors are so worried and, and, and so concerned about any form of regulatory intervention because of their mistrust in the legal system, which does not provide robust support um, for, for, for the stability of the system. So yes, in many ways, China is similar to the US um, in terms of our market structure, in terms of the problem we are facing today, but fundamentally, the regulatory system is distinct um, because of the lack of checks and balance and also the hierarchical um, uh, uh, regulatory structure. However, I'm not saying that the US is, system is perfect because in some aspects of the US regulatory governance, the government the executive branch does face very little checks and balance. And that's particularly in relation to matters relating to national security. The U.S. government has imposed rounds of export restrictions and sanctions on Chinese companies, right? I mean, so if you think about AI industry, the one of the biggest bottleneck of China's AI development is because we the Chinese AI firms cannot get advanced AI chips from NVIDIA due to the rounds of export restrictions from the U.S. government. And you realize in those areas, of government action, U.S. government, you know, the Commerce Department and the executive branch, they can move ahead, you know, with minimal checks and balance, little scrutiny um, from other from other government branches, and and with little resistance from firms, and they can just do it, right? I mean, but there's little oversight of whether they achieve their policy goal, and in fact, there's not even clear what exactly is the policy goal of all these export restrictions and whether it will lead to a lot of side effects, it can potentially backlash, because what is happening, right, with this export restriction is that they are making it difficult for Chinese firms to access uh, advanced technology, but they can source it elsewhere, right, from the U.S. allies countries, right, I mean, so it end up the US comp it's hurting US companies' interest because they're not able to sell to Chinese market, but letting European firms fill in the Chinese market share. Um, and at the same time, you are actually incentivized Chinese to become, to double down on uh, creating advanced technology that can compete with the US, right? I mean, so firms like FT, like Huawei and ZTE just view all this export restriction as a strategic gift to these their businesses. So they are, you know, doing very well, you know, trying to fill in the gap that is left by the U.S. firms. So there's not like very thought out uh, consequence and on the U.S. side of what these export restriction is actually leading to, um, particularly in the medium and longer term. 
So I'm say, seeing that, you know, in that respect, the dynamic pyramid model do seem to apply <laughs> to, you know, those aspects of the US regulatory governance and control. But, you know, query, you know, what we can do about it uh, at the moment. And, and this is a particularly concerning problem. If you think about, you know, the line between what is national security and commercial application is increasingly blurred, right? Just think about example of TikTok. Think about, you know, now just a couple of days ago, Wall Street Journal has an article of now U.S. suspecting the Chinese cranes on the U.S. ports as children horse. So, so Chinese cranes are now a problem. And then EV, again, you know, the China is now the biggest EV manufacturer in the world. And, you know, there is suspicion of Chinese, EV, the, the, the US is going to push, push away the Chinese EV cars for the reason that, you know, the, these, these EV cars could be collecting important data from the US citizens, right? I mean, so increasingly blur boundary between what is national security and what is commercial uh, applications and that could apply all sorts of things um, to to Chinese uh, Chinese products and Chinese services. So um, anyway, so so that's something that I see the, the similarity and uh, difference between these two system. Um, I Harry asked a very good question: Is the Chinese antitrust for real or a facade? <laughs> it's both real that um, um, they do seem to be well intentioned to address this problem, but. but However, I think the regulators should be also be blamed for contributing to the problem in the first place for not vetting any single merger uh, for decades and allowing number one and number two farm and number three farm and number four farm to merge together and <laughs> have a 90% market share. And it's like, that's unbelievable. Um, and then by the time they now want to come back to tackle the problem, it generates huge market backlash and it hardly changed any of the competitive dynamics. And because private investment has retreated, they have flee away from the Chinese market. Um, the new entry actually have dwindled. Now we have less new entry. And, and also because the enforcement costs and the compliance costs have gone up, it kind of reinforced, it kind of disproportionately harm those small and medium sized farms, make it more difficult for them to compete with the bigger farms. So now we have about two years after the crackdown, we, we didn't see any change to the sector. And in fact, new entries have, have become have reduced. So just reinforce the existing market structure very sadly. So they hasn't been able to achieve what it was supposed to do. And, and, and also, you know, if you think about it, one of the reason why the Chinese government want to discipline tech firms also is partly want to nudge these companies to move away from this toxic competition. Uh, excessive competition and move towards, you know, those technology areas that they deem is strategically important to compete with the United States. Um, but now, because you cripple the Chinese most competitive Chinese businesses, right? I mean, a firm like Alibaba and Tencent, they lost over 60 to 75 percent of market share. How do they have the power to compete with the U.S. and invest in key and technological areas? So China just kind of, you know, killing its own, um, you know, most dynamic sector and significantly undermine its initial intention to 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 compete with the US uh, in, in those strategic sectors. So it's it is very sad. So I, I just think that, you know, all these measures are well intentioned and but because regulation operate in a very complex system and there's oftentimes unforeseen consequences agencies just cannot possibly foresee in advance and coming with such drastic actions that tend to generate strong backlash and that's why in the book i also trying to uh trying to give offer some uh, positive notes by thinking you know what can we do to help m mitigate those side effects how do we prevent this from happening in the first place I mean, one suggestion I have is, look, I mean, because you cannot foresee them in advance, so you should try it step by step. That's the gradualism uh, mindset that the, the Chinese leaders like Deng Xiaoping initially proposed it, like crossing the river by touching the stone. You don't do things so drastically, right? You do it gradually. You try it out experimentation. I mean, that's why we used to have decentralized uh, local uh, government's uh, experimentation, and then they try out certain policy, and if it works well, and then they can be replicated nationally. 
right? I mean, so you don't have to do such drastic nationwide crackdown all at once that really scare people off. And um, but unfortunately, our current political climate doesn't allow us to do this kind of uh, decentralized experimentation. But I but I still remain hopeful that you know if things become really bad, I mean, they might roll back some of the restrictions and also might be willing to tie their own hands and um, and really try out some serious and positive uh, market reforms and give agency more autonomy, more independence uh, to carry out their enforcement. Like what Elena mentioned, I mean, these Chinese agencies are very savvy. I mean, these are highly ambitious and very smart people working in the Chinese antitrust authority. But sadly, I mean, and, and frankly, they don't like those cases they're dictated to do, cases like Alibaba and then these cases. I mean, this is a politically driven case. I mean, they would rather really, you know, have the professionalism accountability to do these cases properly. That's how they can build up their career, how, how they see the system can grow and how they see the career can possibly prosper in the Chinese system rather than being viewed as you know political agent uh, for for the chinese state um so should i stop here yeah I, I think that's a good moment to stop because that gives us 12 more minutes for q a and you know there's a lot of talk about competition and one kind of competition we now have is between offline competition and online competition so everyone here in this room participates in offline competition to ask a question and we already have uh, some online uh, questions, but I wanted to give um, the attendees here in the room a chance to ask a question if you have one and to also see how many there are. Oh my God. Okay, so see, see, we have a lot. So maybe let, uh, what's, uh, let's just collect them. So let's get these three questions across the board and, and then give a chance for a quick answer and then I'll read out some of the online questions. Go ahead. Okay, thank you um, and thank you, thanks everyone. Um, so, I have a, so I have a question about the tact the tech um, business that we discussed in this book. So I noticed, as you mentioned, um, it's mostly about consumer tech, but as I understand, like there are some other techs which seems more technical and involves more technology. Yeah. That's like semiconductors or yeah. EVs, and these are like highly tech oriented, and which is also the area that China is trying to catch up with the Western areas. And also, I noticed that the Chinese government seems to have a very different attitude towards these industries. Like yeah. they generally support them, and like I personally have never heard about Chinese government trying to curb any of those companies, like yeah. Xiaomi or Huawei. Yeah. Like uh, I guess there are some like reasons behind that because like maybe first these like these businesses focus on products, which is like pose a less threat to democracy or like to the power of the government. Also because like like these products are sold internationally, so they have to compete with the European and American counterparts. And also because perhaps there's a less network effect, so like it's less likely to have a, to like to emerge a super monopoly in these areas. But I just like wonder like how do you think about these areas and like the antitrust regulation in these areas? Okay, great. Now, next Hi, question. Professor. I'm a PhD candidate and also a visiting scholar at Columbia University. So my question is, we commonly use hierarchy to describe the bureaucratic system, um, but you use this word to describe the relationship between the leader's government and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the government, the relationship between the firms, the public. So can you explain more about this? Because the Alibaba is 100% private company. Great. And there was a third question. Yes. Um, my question is actually about China's antitrust enforcement and also the market dynamics. So there are some private uh, antitrust lawsuits in China. There are Jingdong versus Alibaba for exclusive dealing, and there's ByteDance versus uh, Tencent for refusing to offer interoperability. So they're aggressively initiating antitrust lawsuit instead of just taking the hit from the government. So do you think that um, those market participants as motivated by competition can be a source of bringing antitrust enforcement back to, uh, I don't know, normal or basic or regular mode? And or is, is that just like a competition between the oligopolies and contribute nothing to the market? Right. 
Okay. Great. So, yeah. yeah. Very good. Um, so how China regulate hardcore technology? So yes, I mean, regulation actually have many different dimensions. So in the book, I mostly talk about kind of the predator nature of China's tech regulation, right? I mean, it's a lot of restrictive measures, but our regulation also had its enabling effects. So I would see that how China regulates hardcore sector is more enabling. And um, so regulation in that regard is kind of like good for businesses. So in the last chapter of the book, I do touch upon AI being one of the booming and important area and I was view as one of the critical area uh, in the Sino-US tech library. And you see the government is doing all it can to try to send very strong and friendly market signal to the uh, to very good, uh, very friendly signal to the market participants that is enabling this industry, despite the fact it, it does also need to impose strict information control. But for the most part, the book does talk, fo does focus on kind of consumer tech businesses rather than the hardcore tech uh, businesses. But like in the last chapter, I started to venture into AI and then that actually laid out um, kind of like, um, they a clue for my next book. I mean, it will be more about uh, hardcore technology. Now, the second question about, um, you know, uh, like firms, the, the, the position of the Chinese firms, um, if I understand correctly. So now in, in the hierarchy itself, firms is one important player. Yes, like Alibaba is 100% um, private owned. And in fact, was owned by a lot of the foreign investors. SoftBank uh, has a very big stake in Alibaba. And um, and and so you know the, what the model was trying to map out was the relationship between you know firms and um, you know regulators and as as between firms and also the the top leaders right I mean you see firm actually are not passive players I mean these businesses they um, they do a lot of things underneath the table I mean unlike here you know you have a lot of formal lobbying. Uh, channels, but in China, they have to rely more on the informal lobbying channels through information intermediaries or political intermediaries to try to achieve their policy objectives. Um, so I do give the firm quite a lot of discussion in the book and in, tr in trying to unravel the state business relationship in China. But that definitely interests are intertwined with a lot of political elites and um, uh, um, in, in China, that's a way they can seek political protection in, in the Chinese system. And last question about China's antitrust enforcement, the private enforcement. Look, I mean, the case uh, back then, JD.com, to, in 2015, already brought the case against Alibaba for the Choose Woman 2 business practice. It wasn't until last year they finally delivered the decision, right? I mean, <laughs> there are so many ways they can keep postponing um litigation tactics that they can keep delaying a case again and again so it's like it's it's been um how many years right i mean um nine years for for we to have a final decision um and and for a really long time they have debated on the jurisdictional issues so the case didn't really in, move into substance until after the crackdown and you see judges were now able you know dare to make a a decision and also impose a huge fine. I think it was a fine involving, uh, it's it's a very high fine, over a hundred um, million uh, uh, R uh, RMB, right? I mean, it's it's also partly because the policy wind has shifted, right? So we, we haven't had any decision of the interoperability cases involving my dance. Um, and, and so, yes, private enforcement is feasible, but let's, Bear that in mind, the Chinese judiciary is not a very strong actor, despite the fact that we legal scholars tend to pay a lot of attention to jurisprudence and to Chinese judiciary and, and to the judicial opinions. But in China, the most consequential actor is the bureaucracy, is the policymakers. And, um, and, and that's that they can make decisions that, that can have huge uh, economic financial implications. Thanks so much. So we have about four minutes left, but I'll still put all the questions on the table that our online audience posed either before the session or, or now using the Q&A infrastructure that Zoom provides, because those questions in a way reflect everything that we can find in this book. So we can zoom in and uh, try to figure out how a certain case study looks like in light of the dynamic pyramid model. So we have two case study questions. 
One is about the AND IPO. And the question is, to what extent is this about Jack Ma? And to what extent is this about concerns that uh, there's too much shadow banking, creating these kinds of systemic risks that you discussed in your presentation? Uh, so the Chinese government really be less worried about losing control, but more uh, losing control as a political actor, but more worried about losing control over the financial uh, sector as the US did in 2008. The second case study is, is TikTok. So the question there is how should we think about TikTok in light of the dynamic pyramid uh, model? What is TikTok? Is TikTok a US company because it operates in the US? Is it a Singaporean company as a Singaporean CEO, as we saw, as we insisted in, in the hearing in Congress? Or is it really a Chinese company because of the ByteDance, um, in, uh, ByteDance ownership of uh, the company? So how should we think about an actor like TikTok in light of your theory? And then, um, so that's the, the two case studies and, and, and TikTok. And then in terms of the theory and what to get out of it, one question we, we got is about the normative concerns that the Chinese government might have. Do you think those normative concerns might change over time? And is the dynamic pyramid model able to also account for concerns that are different from the big tech related concerns that we have seen so far? So in a way, it's a question about the predictive power of the model. And then the final question is also a normative one about policy recommendations. So in your presentation in the book, you, one gets the feeling that fra fragility might be a problem, that it, it's maybe not a good idea to have that kind of disequilibrium in the regulatory approach. So the question is what to do about it. What kind of policy recommendations would you have to address fragility? And you have two minutes to answer all of these questions, but they really meant also as um, questions that we might think about as we go out into this beautiful New York Sunday, uh, New York afternoon. And yeah. So Great. I mean, well, the Jack Ma, I have I have answered that question, right? I mean, I think more fundamentally has to do with the the, the regulatory tensions between the financial regu regulator and and group's uh, business model. Now, in terms of TikTok, I mean, it it is not a Chinese, uh, it is owned by a Chinese company, but it's not a Chinese company, right? Um, and um, however, what the China but what, how the chi China regulates uh, ByteDance uh, will cause a very long shadow uh, over TikTok's uh, operation in the U.S. and and that's holding back um, the farm's expansion. But but Chinese companies are very adaptable. Like I mean, TikTok knows in the U.S. system, I can take full advantage of its checks and balance and challenge the government, which is what it is doing, right? I mean, I'm sure if this bill is ultimately adopted, which seems to be losing momentum right now. But if it is adopted, I'm without doubt that TikTok would challenge it in court and say, look, this is an de facto ban and then it's violates of freedom of speech. And third, uh, for the question about nomadic concern and um, nomadic implication of this book, I mean, definitely have nomadic implication, but I, because I think the dynamic pyramid model do have predictive power as we talk about, right? I mean, we are currently stuck in a vicious cycle, right? And then, um, and that relates to the last question what is the policy recommendation, right? I mean, how do we break this vicious cycle? I think the only way that we can escape from this cycle is that we need to start from the very beginning. We need to loosen up the hierarchy. We need to give agency more independence and more autonomy. We need to give the bureaucracy, you know, uh, uh, that, that freedom to try out new policy experimentation. Um, losing up that hierarchy, losing up the state control over businesses is the only way to go because that's, and more fundamentally, they need to restore people's confidence in the Chinese legal system because that's the only way they can restore people's confidence in the Chinese economy. Let me end here. Awesome. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Angela. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you to the US Asia Law Institute for co-hosting and co-sponsoring this event with us, Catherine and, and Amy. Thanks to our expert commentators. And thanks to Angela for writing this book and bringing it back to NYU. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, guys.